This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Leanne, I'm the wellness manager here at UCSF and put on this event with my team. Uh, we're called Living Well at UCSF. I'm sure many of you might have heard about us. But what we're really here for today is um, a wonderful panel discussion with our sugar science experts from UCSF. So we're lucky enough to have a wonderful panel here to my right, and they're gonna help us bring the truth of science on sugar out of the research journals and into our laps. So really make it kind of accessible to the everyday person and not necessarily just the researcher. They're gonna be discussing sugar science, the recent initiative that was launched in November. I'm sure many of you um, know what that is, but in case you are not aware, sugar science is a nationwide initiative that takes unbiased, evidence-based research and makes it accessible to the public. So here to introduce our panelists today and moderate our discussion is Barbara French. <clears throat> Barbara French is our Vice Chancellor of Strategic Communications and University Relations at UCSF. In her role, she's charged with developing and implementing communications programs and champions the university's mission. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Barbara French. Well, thank you for all uh, making time to join us today and be here. It's uh, pretty amazing when you have a panel of uh, distinguished faculty who are going to help cull through thousands of medical journals and help you understand what you need to know, particularly at a time when whether or not you're reading Michael Pollan or whether or not you're following the tax on sugar, you're kind of saying, what do I need to, there's a lot out there, what do I need to know? And you know, if you grew up at a time where I did, where my, you know, you served dinner and my mom went and opened a can of string beans, right? And that was it. it we've come a long way towards kind of trusting what's in the can or package thinking, well, it must be good for us, right? It says vegetable on it or it says fruit. And really understand what do we need to know? How complicated and complex have things have become and what do we as consumers need to know and how can we take an active role in making sure we're healthy, our kids are healthy, and our communities are healthy. So I'm uh, really glad that we've made time for this today. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, to my immediate right is Dean Schillinger. Dean is a professor of medicine and residence here at UCSF, and he's also chief of the uh, Division of General Internal Medicine at our affiliate hospital, San Francisco General Hospital. He's also an internationally recognized expert in health communication science, and his area of focus includes health literacy, health communication, and chronic d disease prevention and management. So thanks, Dean. Um, in the middle is Laura Schmidt. Laura is a, also a professor here at UCSF in our School of Medicine. She has dedicated her career to how lifestyle risk factors, such as alcohol, poor diet, influence chronic disease and health inequities. And then to her right is uh, Kristen Kearns. Kristen is a postdoc fellow in the School of Medicine, and she became interested in the effects of sugar when serving as a dental director for clinics serving low-income populations in Denver, Colorado. So each of them kind of come together from slightly different perspectives, so it should be a dynamic, um, a dynamic conversation. And we certainly hope you're sitting around thinking about good questions about how do I take this, what do I need to know? So first up, Laura, um, do you want to talk exactly about what sugar science is yep. and tell us a bit about what it, what it is and why it is? I am happy to do that. Liquid sugar is everywhere. It's the largest single source of added sugar in our diet, and we're drinking way too much of it. Growing scientific evidence shows taking in too much added sugar from things like soda and sports drinks overloads critical organs, which can lead to diseases like heart disease and diabetes. There are things you really need to know about sugar. Go to sugarscience.org. 
That's our commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Sugar Science, I'm the lead investigator on it. It's funded through a, a, a private philanthropic uh, donor, uh, the John, uh, Laura and John Arnold Foundation. And the real goal of Sugar Science is to get what we know out of the me medical journals and into the public awareness. And uh, there's a lot, as you may have noticed, a lot of misinformation and confusing information out there about nutrition. And there's also a lot of new interest in the scientific community around sugar. We, uh, there's been really a paradigm shift around sugar in the last uh, five, 10 years. We used to just worry about, you know, think, well, sugar, it's excess calories. Sugar makes you fat. But now we're realizing that it actually makes you sick. And there's a lot of research to support uh, the health harms associated with consuming too much sugar, particularly around liver disease, diabetes, and heart disease. And those are the things that we focus on, uh, trying to get that message and the word from science out to the community. So UCSF is a really cool place to be doing this. And the reason why is because we are one of the last remaining academic, publicly funded public sector academic medical centers in the country. There's only one other. And we have, uh, because of who we are, we have a mission to serve the public. And sugar science is really about that mission, our public service mission, trying to reach out and give back to the taxpayers who pay for our salaries and, and support our work, whether it's through the state of California or through the NIH. We're the largest recipient of NIH grants in the country, and taxpayers pay for us, and we ought to pay back. And that's really the heart of what we do. Uh, as people are probably aware, there's a lot of confusion and mis misinformation out there. We know from scientific reviews that there, uh, that there is tremendous bias in the research and due to funding conflicts of interest. Uh, studies where investigators are funded by industry, uh, studies of the relationship between sugar and obesity are five times more likely to report that there's no problem with sugar and obesity if the investigators are funded by industry. So while we, we at Sugar Science in, the, in our large 8,000 article, we work with the, our medical library to sift through all the literature and come up with the best information possible, we look at that. It's not like we exclude studies just because an investigator has industry funding, but we think carefully about who's writing it, what their agenda might be, and we try to be as transparent as possible. So our, 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 really our watchword is scientific integrity. We want people to be able to come, hear our message, and trust us. And if we don't know the right answer, we, we say so. <laughs> so there's hopefully a little bit of humility in what we have to do. We're doing this thing right now. It's an Instagram campaign, and I didn't even know what Instagram was uh, when we started out, but I've learned a little bit about social media, and it's called hashtag sugar shift 2015. And the idea here is that we all know that people around this time of year want to make uh, New Year's resolutions, and I'll share with you mine because it's usually like everybody, you know, they're way, way ambitious. My 12-year-old my daughter has a list of 12 resolutions. I have one, and it's really ambitious. It's to keep my car clean for the year. <laughs> But Sugar Shift is about making a small change that allows you to reduce your sugar consumption. So we know from, we did a careful review of all the expert panels and the guidelines around what would be a healthy amount. And we, we feel that a rough, probably women should be consuming, adult women, around six teaspoons of added sugar a day, added sugar, not the sugar that comes in fruit and, and, and uh, naturally occurring, but added sugar. And men, about nine teaspoons a day. That's probably a pretty good recommendation uh, if you can do that. And and so the sugar shift idea is can we work together as a public and a community to help each other make small changes in our sugar consumption that add up to big changes over time. Not grandiose, uh, I'm gonna keep my car clean for a year, but small changes that actually will you know, make a difference over the course of time. And so if you um, log on to sugarscience.org or go to SugarShift2015 uh, using Twitter, you can share with other people your commitment, which is kind of a cool thing, because when you think about it, sharing what you're going to do with a large bunch of other people who are trying to do the same thing, that's 
social support writ large, right? And we have people writing in from the public talking about all the different things that they're uh, trying. I'm just going to, this year, I'm going to put half of a teaspoon of sugar in my coffee in the morning, you know? Or I'm going to just swap out a glass of water for that one soda a day. And small things that will add up to big changes in your metabolic health over the course of the year. So we really enc encourage you to join us in Sugar Shift. Uh, we're all uh, on Instagram telling, you know, you can do a little, a little thing, make yourself a celebrity. <laughs> and uh, really encourage you to do that. And, and really, together, I think, UCSF, as well as the large public following that we've already established in the short time that we've been uh, out there in the media, uh, together, we really can, I think, over time, change the conversation in America about sugar and health. So next up, so the, the big question is kind of how much sugar is too much sugar? Laura gave some indication of a range for women and for men. Um, and so we're going to ask uh, Christine, Kristen to come up and get into this a little bit more. How much is too much? There we go. So I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about how much sugar we're actually eating. And on average, we consume 66 pounds of sugar per year. And just to give you a sense for what that looks like, this is a four pound bag of sugar. Add another pound and a half, and that's what we're eating per month on average. If you really want to get a sense for it, put it in your backpack like I did and walk up Parnassus <laughs> and really feel <laughs> what four pounds of sugar looks like. Now, the American Heart Association in 2009 came out with some guidelines to help us uh, understand how much sugar really is too much in our diet. So they came up with some figures. We've got it here in teaspoons. So for women, the recommendation is no more than six teaspoons of added sugar per day. For men, it's nine teaspoons. And then for children, it ranges between three and six, depending on their age and weight. So to give you a sense for what six teaspoons of sugar, which is the max that I should be eating in a day, um, so that's really not very much. I mean, you can think about easy way to cut things out if you're adding teaspoons of sugar to your tea or coffee in the morning, or if you're adding sugar to recipes at home, you could certainly cut down on the sweetness, but really, gosh, that's not much at all. Or some people, instead of drinking coffee in the morning, might drink a Coke. Can anyone guess how many uh, teaspoons of sugar are in this. 65 grams of sugar in this Coke. And actually, to really understand um, when you're looking at products, you have to be able to convert teaspoons to grams. So we would multiply roughly by four. Um, 25 grams of sugar is the most that I should be eating in a day. So right off the bat, this is almost three times as much sugar that I should be consuming in a day. That's pretty incredible when you think about it. And then there are other products in the grocery store, which, by the way, about 74% of packaged foods in the grocery store contain added sugars. Then we have products that like to promote themselves as being healthy. This Nutrigrain bar tells us it has no high fructose corn syrup, made with real fruit and whole grains. But then if you look at the label, which you kind of actually need a magnifying glass to see it, 12 grams of sugar, so that's half of what I should eat in a day. And then I don't actually know whether that's added sugar or whether that's sugar that comes from the raspberries that are supposedly in this product. To really understand, I actually have to look at the ingredients label. And at Sugar Science, we've actually got a list of all the different names of sugars that can be in a product. So it's not just sucrose, like the table sugar I had in that bag, but it's corn syrup. So looking at this, the fruit filling made with real fruit. The first ingredient is invert sugar. Then we've got corn syrup. Oh, and then there's the raspberry puree concentrate. But you really have to be a sleuth to understand how much added sugar are in these products, especially in healthy products. So with that. That would be three teaspoons of sugar, though? That's right. So half your daily. That's half my daily. Right. Exactly. That's right. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Barb. Great. So Dean, come tell us if we are ingesting too much sugar, what's happening? How does it make us sick? 
Sure. Uh, before I do that, I, I wanted, actually wanted to thank Barbara for her support um, of the scientists on sugar science um, in this endeavor. It's been really an incredible example of how UCSF leadership can support scientists uh, to do their work. Also, Kristen Bull, who's been like the genius behind all the communications. And then, of course, Laura Schmidt for, for leading us in this um, effort. We've been talking about it for a long time. She actually did something about it, so that's great. So um, a couple of messages I wanted to convey, um, first and foremost, is that people tend to think about the sugar problem as the obesity problem. And while sugar absolutely contributes to obesity, um, it is not necessarily the pathway through which bad health happens. You can get sick from sugar in the absence of becoming obese. You can also get sh sick from sugar in the presence of obesity, but the two are not always entirely linked. Um, the three major chronic diseases that are a consequence, well, I'll say four because we have a dentist on the panel. Um, the four major chronic diseases, and because it's true, uh, the first one is chronic periodontal disease or gum disease. And gum disease is bad because you lose your teeth and then you need dentures, and then it's harder to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, so there's a cycle. So periodontal disease. The second uh, major public health issue is cardiovascular disease, which means heart disease and stroke. Um, the third is type 2 diabetes, and the fourth is liver disease and liver failure, and I'm going to go into each one of these in some detail. Um, first, let me just tell a little story. It's not on the slide, but when I started as a resident at San Francisco General Hospital in my clinic, um, it was pretty rare for me to take care of a patient with diabetes. And when I saw a patient with diabetes, I just referred them to the diabetes clinic, which is the specialist clinic, because there were relatively few of them, and we were relatively untrained to take care of them in the outpatient setting. Um, flash forward 25 years later, um, I've lost hair, I've gained a little weight, um, I know I'm chief of the division, and half of my patient visits in clinic are with people who have type 2 diabetes. Half. And you can't say it's because human beings changed that dramatically in one generation. Something in the environment changed, and what really changed was the sugar consumption. So that's... Um, Fact number one. Fact number two, I just want to make clear, because I know many of you are going to have this confusion in your mind, which is what is sugar? So uh, Kristen was showing you the Domino sugar package. That has sucrose in it. That's the chemical name, sucrose. And sucrose is made up of two types of sugar, glucose and fructose. And what I'm going to talk about next really relates to the fructose component of sugar, um, which appears to be particularly problematic and some uh, people believe even toxic to the body. So glucose, we kind of digest, absorb, and our body kind of uses in a fairly seamless way. Fructose, on the other hand, is digested, absorbed, and then is what's called metabolized or processed solely by the liver. So all the sugar we eat, half of it goes to the liver. And the liver is a wonderful organ, but it can only do so much so quickly. And if the liver gets overwhelmed with fructose, like in high fructose corn syrup, which is almost exclusively the fructose component of sugar, it begins to transform that fructose into fat. So the liver becomes fatty. So the first problem we see with high exposure and intake of sugar and high fructose corn syrup is fatty liver. And fatty liver is one of the components of what is called metabolic syndrome, these metabolic diseases that you've heard about. In some communities, liver failure from this process is more common than liver failure from hepatitis. Hepatitis A, B, and C. People are needing liver transplants now in this country because of their intake of fructose. The second um, problem we see related to particularly fructose intake is diabetes. And then the third is heart disease. Um, there have been a number of studies now showing that um, 
intake of uh, sugar uh, is directly proportional to the hazard of having heart disease. The more sugar, added sugar you eat, the greater your risk. If you're in the highest quintile, the highest fifth of the US population in terms of how much added sugar you eat, you've got over a two-fold risk of heart attack and stroke. Even after controlling for, adjusting for obesity, it's not the obesity, it's just the sugar intake. So we don't know exactly why this happens. It may be that the fat that the liver produces from the fructose then goes into the bloodstream and that fat clogs your arteries. We don't really know, but we do know that there is this very strong relationship between sugar, added sugar intake and heart disease and stroke. And then when you have that high level of blood sugar in your mouth and in your bloodstream, the bacteria in your mouth and in your bloodstream love to set up shop in the gums. It's like a great, they're like so happy. They're like, oh, sugar, yeah, let's, you know. And not only does this periodontal disease cause tooth loss, but there's growing evidence that active inflammation in the mouth can promote diabetes, can promote kidney failure, and the need for dialysis. These other kinds of chronic diseases that all go together. And as you know, diabetes itself, is a horrible disease related to blindness, amputations, kidney failure, impotence, you name it, you can get it from type 2 diabetes. So in sum, um, the excessive intake of added sugar, and we're not talking about people who are drinking 19 Cokes a day, we're talking about what Kristen was presenting, um, leads to a disruption in the normal function of the liver. Uh, which can't process this fructose. Instead, it begins to create fat in the liver and make you insulin resistant, which in turn leads to diabetes, heart disease, periodontal disease, maybe kidney disease, and some tantalizing evidence, although small, about even causing progression uh, of cancer and poor recovery from, from cancer. That's early science. But clearly related to this metabolic spectrum of diseases and we need to intervene at the individual level, we need to intervene at the institutional level and at the societal level if we're going to reduce the burden of a preventable set of diseases um, on our population. I'll just say one last thing and then I'll pass it off, which is that I work at San Francisco General Hospital, which obviously takes care of folks in the southeast corner of the city where there's the highest double, triple, quadruple the rate of uh, consumption of agar added sugars in, uh, in the diet as compared to, let's say, this neighborhood, and yet that population is the least aware of the science that we're presenting. So there have to be efforts to kind of spread the word in a way that can be both understood and accepted, because we're asking people to make some fundamental changes in their choices, changes that sometimes have deep economic impacts, because to buy healthy food, you've got to pay more money. So I'll stop there. Thanks. So we definitely want to make sure we have ample time for questions, but all this kind of leads us, I know, if you're like me, you're sitting there and thinking, okay, well, I don't drink soda, so I'm safe, right? <laughs> and is there, you know, something else I need to be aware of? How can I make little changes during my day or encourage my family to make little changes during the day, even if I don't keep soda in the house, what are the other things I need to be mindful of? So Laura, do you want to give us just a couple of examples? Yeah, yeah. Because one of the things, you know, that we've really tr uh, tr tried to do with sugar science is, you know, the news, especially the news we just heard from Dean, is kind of hard to hear. <laughs> it's tough stuff. And most of us, uh, just like smoking back in the 50s, you know, you grow up thinking, oh, well, everybody does this, it's benign. And uh, so now the scientific community is in the hard position of having to say, hey, something you love and think is benign and fine is actually harmful to your health. And so that's a hard message to share. And so one of the, you know, working, we've had this wonderful communications team courtesy of Barb and, and Kristen Boll and, and uh, our, our own local communication specialists. And, and uh, we've really tried to soften what 
of the message, make it understandable, clear, interpretable, and to just, so that we're not just constantly barking bad news at people. And so one of the things that we try to do is share with people small changes that they can make that can add up to big improvements. And because added sugars in 74% of the uh, packaged foods in the supermarket, it's hiding everywhere. And that makes, and labels are not adequate for actually helping people navigate how much added sugar is in any given product. So w the first thing we, we suggest people do is to really, really cut down or cut out those sugary beverages, sports drinks, sodas, um, uh, uh, fruit drinks where it's F-R-O-O-T. <laughs> and the reason, it, the, there are a couple reasons. One is because uh, these products provide you with very limited, if any, nutritional value. And a very, as Kristen pointed out, a really heavy dose of sugar. In fact, one Coke is more than the recommended dose for, uh, or one soda uh, for a woman on a daily basis. So that's a first step. And if people, if the American public were um, able to completely cut out sugary drinks, we would lower our collective sugar consumption by 37%. So that's a big whopping chunk of it. And there's, I, I, I don't want to get into all of the details, but sugarscience.org shares a lot of this information about why it is that liquid sugar has particularly harmful uh, consequences for the kinds of metabolic uh, mechanisms and disease processes that Dean was reviewing with you. And by with liquid sugar, you mean? Sports drinks, sodas, and uh, uh, fruit drinks without fruit. <laughs> Uh, uh, the second thing we really encourage people to do is read those labels. And if you go to sugarscience.org, we, we sent our team out, and we looked at every label we could in grocery stores and around online and stuff, and we came up with 61 different names for sugar on the ingredients label, right? And so, you know, the typical, you know, label will say, you know, it's got, you know, it's got invert sugar, and then it's got some, some, uh, you know, maltodextrin. maltodextrin and dextrose, and then some maltose, and you know what? All of that's just sugar. And so that helps you. You know that if it says that stuff, it's been added to the product. And so that's the way for now until we have a, a sugar, la a, a nutritional label that actually pulls out and says, here's how much added sugar's in the product, which the FDA is considering doing right now. Uh, you, can, you can at least know that you're consuming added sugar. And, you should, and, and so when it says total sugar, you know there's a lot of added sugar if it's got any of those uh, chemical names on the product. And so those would be the first two simple steps. Lower, if not um, completely uh, withdraw sugary beverages from your diet and look at those labels and try to, uh, try to avoid the hidden sugars. You know, it's a lot, if you're taking that sugar at the table and you're holding in a teaspoon and you're putting it in something, you know how much you're consuming, right? You're looking at it. But if it's hidden in a product that's marketed as healthy, if it's hidden in a product that uh, uh, says, uh, you know, high in vitamin C, and if it's hidden in a product because you need to be a chemist to read the ingredients label, then that's a concern. So avoiding the packaged products in general, but particularly those that can, have can those just, sugary. Uh, can I just comment on that? Because that is obviously my kids give me incessant grief about this because um, I buy breakfast cereals that are relatively low in sugar and you know there, there's one cereal that won't, won't be named you look on the on the back and that's it, it says there's um, 12 grams of added sugar so 12 divided by 4 that's 3 grams so that's half of what a, of a woman or that's the total dose of my 8 year old that's it for the day right that one bowl three of cereal teaspoons. right 3 teaspoons um, because that's 12 divided by 4 is 3 teaspoons um, but you have to also remember that that's for one portion of cereal, which is like a really <laughs> tiny bowl of cereal. Um, and so it's not that you can eat as much as you want, you're gonna get three teaspoons, that you can eat one little tiny bowl of it, and that's half of your daily sugar. So the whole portion size thing is also pretty yeah, dicey. that's very important. Okay, let's, uh, let's get into Q and A's. I think to, to start out, um, is sugar addictive? 
Well, I happen to be an addiction researcher. <laughs> and uh, 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 right now, the jury's out. Uh, we know, the thing we know, uh, there are a lot of different things that go into addiction. Loss of control, preoccupation with the substance, uh, uh, a, a withdrawal, tolerance. There are a lot of things that go into w what qualifies in terms of a psychiatric definition of addiction. Uh, what we do know for, sh you know, we have very solid ev evidence on, uh, and we need more research in this area, and this is going to be a big thrust, I think, in the coming years in, uh, in medical research to really nail down how do um, sh sugary foods as well as hyperpalatable foods, uh, foods loaded with salt and fat as well as sugar, how are they addictive and if, in what ways? We have a lot of wonderful research going on here on campus around stress. Alyssa um, Pell's work, she's on our team, uh, looks at stress and, and stress eating as well. Uh, and we know there's a connection. We just haven't quite done all the research to, 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 to be able to to say it's addictive. But we do know one thing, people crave it. And the way we know, we know that there's craving, we, we study rats that, uh, from rat studies, but we also know from human uh, fMRI, functional resonance, ma magnetic resonance imaging research, when you put a person who's, say, addicted to cocaine or addicted to some other, other drug of abuse into an MRI and you show them, say, the works, <laughs> you show them, you know, if they're a heroin addict, you show them an image that uh, makes them think of the, of the substance they're addicted to, you'll see part, certain regions of the brain light up and you will also see changes in dopamine levels. It's a neurotransmitter or chemical in the brain. Uh, actual changes over time, a, a, um, a phenomenon we call dopamine downregulation. So the brain itself actually adjusts to the constant reintroduction of, of um, addictive substances in the brain. And so we can image, in, in fMRI studies, we know that for people who claim that they crave uh, a, a sugar and have difficulty not consuming sugar, we can image uh, craving. And from our rat and our human studies, we also have uh, nailed down the phenomenon of dopamine downregulation, which is actual changes in the, in the um, levels of, of chemicals in the brain and the neurotransmitters that um, uh, uh, bind to those chemicals. And so we know, we have pretty good evidence that, that when people say, I'm a junk food junkie and I can't stop thinking about it, I'm craving it, that, that that's a, an act actual phenomenon and that the, is one the of the the craving that you the craving images that you said with the sugar person are they essentially the same images you have with the heroin guy looking you will at the see the yeah. same okay. you will see the same, same neurochemical areas changes light up in the and brain <laughs> and so this tells us that one of the hallmarks of addiction not every so there are a lot of different things that go into the uh, disorder that we call addiction but one of the hallmarks craving we have pretty strong evidence that uh, uh, sugar uh, does the same thing that uh, other drugs that we we view as addictive do All right I'm going to move us along because we have a lot of good questions so uh, we have a whole bank of questions around alternatives, like stevia, agave. Uh, what about sweeteners like Truvia? Are artificial sweeteners bad? What sugar substitutes are OK to consume? So kind of all around sugar substitutes, and how do we look at them? Oh, I'm going to get that question. <laughs> you got it, Kristen? <laughs> That's a tough question actually. Artificial sweeteners, they are regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. They do look at the safety of sugars. And so our products that are on the market are considered to be safe by the FDA. However, uh, there are some studies that have come out more recently that are looking at artificial sweeteners in slightly different ways, uh, looking at uh, changes in the bacteria in our gut, for example. Was that done here? Or that no, that was uh, the one in Nature. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was a... The, no, no, that okay. was... Not here. Not you, here. You, you know more about that one. Do yeah. you want to yeah. describe that? Uh, there's actually a series of studies now. The uh, Nature is one of the premier science journals in the world. And uh, so the one in Nature, which included studies of animals as well as humans, uh, looked at a variety of uh, popular uh, uh, artificial sweeteners on the market, aspartame, uh, um, sucralose, and saccharin. 
and in both the animal studies and the human studies, what they showed was that uh, they raised, so, so backing up a minute, we've known for a long time that artificial sweetener consumption, ironically, is connected to increased gait, weight gain and metabolic disease. And so people have been saying, why would that be? You know, they have no calories? What, what's going on there? And these guys actually figured out the answer to that question. The artificial sweeteners were producing a condition very related, you know, that, that Dean talked about called glucose intolerance. Uh, and what essentially that, what they found was that there's this, in our gut, there's this wonderful microflora, right? You know those probiotics and yogurt that people are encouraged to consume? That stuff is really, really important for our health. They talk about it now as the microbiome, like a, it's, a, it's a whole natural system living in our, in our, in our guts. And that microbiome, the, the beneficial bacteria that aid in our digestion and absorption of nutrients are killed by artificial sweeteners. And as a result of that, through a pretty complex cascade of changes going on in the body, it, you wind up producing glucose intolerance, one of the hallmarks of metabolic disease. That insulin resistance. Insulin yeah. resistance. So how about the honey? The very thing that, that Dean is seeing in his diabetic patients. So how about honey, honey, which is another alternative people use? <laughs> well, I guess if I were going to choose between honey and table sugar, uh, I would probably go with honey because we do know that honey actually contains some additional good things like antioxidants, uh, potentially some vitamins. So it well, honey, honey is glucose, right? So it doesn't have... It has the, a higher does it glucose. Ha mostly glucose, but does it have fructose in uh, it? it some. I think it does, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, well, and honey gets complicated because there's all different types of honey Honey. Some is more refined than others. Some you get from your local farmer's market, you know, with the local bees. So you know, honey, it's complicated, uh, but it does have some additional things in it that make it slightly different than the typical sugars. Yeah. Can, you, can, you, can you give us just a little bit of a ratio of glucose to glucose? And I think it was, I, I'd have to look, you know, go to sugarscience.org. We have a blog on this, and it actually, I think we give the ratio. I think it's, it's not a lot. It's slightly higher in glucose and lower in fructose. But interestingly, it has slightly more calories than table sugar. But on the other hand, you know, maybe people, and this we have no research on, maybe people mm -hmm. put a little less of it in because it's so, so viscous. Uh, but but it was interesting because we have this wonderful we we have a great library here at UCSF it is world class and they have been collaborators with us and we have a wonderful medical librarian on our team Evans Whitaker and uh, we asked all of our specialists you know we got 12 people nutritionists and and they all said huh honey I don't know I'm I'm thinking it's probably just the same as other kinds of sugar so Wit goes and does an exhaustive PubMed you know uh, search of the literature. And lo and behold, he turns up all these studies that have been done in the Mideast that demonstrate actually um, uh, with honey consumption, not in excess, but in, 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 in small amounts, um, uh, some potential uh, heart health protection. Um, so as Kristen said, if it's going to be a choice between table sugar and honey, and, and, and you think that honey's probably coming from real bees mm. <laughs> and hasn't been processed through a factory, it might be not a bad idea to, 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 to pick the honey. We still recommend people try to stay within those six teaspoons for women, nine teaspoons for men limits. Is there on the kind of these kind of areas, what's the difference between regular sugar, what a consumer would call regular sugar, and if I go into my health food store and I see something called raw sugar, right? What's the difference? Well, so far, we, Kimber Stanhope on our team, who is a nutrition expert and, and does experimental studies, and Witt, our uh, librarian, have both looked into this issue. And at this point, Molasses may have some antioxidants that, that may be uh, like, kind of like honey. There isn't a lot of research on it. Uh, the, but uh, most forms of raw sugar and so forth are probably going to impact your, your metabolic health in a manner quite similar to table sugar. Okay. How about diet sodas? 
Yeah, well, we already talked about, about artificial sweeteners. Uh, a lot of people ask about stevia because it's being marketed right now as a natural uh, uh, product, but um, where do, our where do most of our artificial sweeteners come from? <laughs> well, they're synthetically made. So stevia is kind of a complicated case, but the actual sweetener, it's Reb-A for short, and so that, actually, that has been looked at by the FDA and, again, stamped that it is safe. But I think there's a lot that we don't know about stevia. It's a new product. Um, not all of the stevia-based brands are quite the same, um, so I think there's, the jury is still out. There's a lot well, still to learn. There was a recent study of stevia. It was a fairly well-done study that showed that um, it increased insulin resistance and increased blood sugar. And the irony there is that stevia has been heavily promoted as the sugar substitute for people with diabetes. Yeah. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, and so that's really the only study of stevia because it's so new on the market. That's the only one. We on sugar science, we like to uh, really be careful. So we like to produce what we call robust, res mm -hmm. sci share scientific robust evidence. So where we have numerous studies from rats and humans and all different kinds of studies done over and over again that po basically point to the same conclusion. Uh, when we did the lit search, there's just this one one study on stevia, uh, but it, the so it sounds like it's probably in the territory of the other artificial sweeteners, not so good for your metabolic health. What, you know, we got a lot into the uh, disease ramifications. So a couple of questions around are these diseases you discussed, like type 2 and fatty liver, if you stop eating sugar, you cut back, are they reversible? So yeah, I can respond to that. Um, there's no question, particularly early in the course of the disease, in type 2 diabetes and in fatty liver, that if you severely curb your uh, sugar intake, that you can, in the majority of cases, uh, return your blood indicators to to normal. Um, once you know, once you've had diabetes for two, three, four years, it, then it, then it gets harder to do. Um, but there are also a number of studies in the pediatric literature um, where they see a lot of fatty liver um, of interventions that reduce um, sugar consumption, and the fatty liver um, resolves to normal on imaging studies. What about the? What do we need to know about alcohol and sugar? Uh, well, if you're mixing uh, drinks with sugary beverages, those uh, those count. <laughs> those count. The daiquiri that counts. counts. <laughs> the daiquiri counts. Alcohol itself. Uh, typically, we looked into this because uh, we have a lot of people asking this question, and there doesn't tend to be a lot of added sugar in, say, a glass wine, of wine or beer. Right. Yeah, that, that it, it, it's not typical to have it added. But to, is it, is it to safe to say product. that we don't know if there are interactive effects between yes. sugar and alcohol with respect yeah. to, for example, liver damage? Well, we, we actually uh, we there's a, somebody at University of Colorado who's do, do, doing research on this very issue. It's unpublished. Uh, and so it isn't yet peer-reviewed. Uh, it's in, in the hopper uh, that su suggests that, indeed, there are adverse mm. interactions. For the liver? Uh, not, for the liver, consuming fruct fructose along with alcohol and also salt. So mm. uh, those salty snacks when those mixed bar drinks may, in fact, be problematic. But this is only early studies on animals. And so it's the kind of results that we say we, we, what we like to do is call it emerging science. We watch, we're going to watch it, we're going to, uh, the minute we feel like there's a lot of robust evidence, we'll report it out. Great question. Great question, yeah. So once, once um, uh, the alcohol hits your liver, just like the fructose, the process what your liver does with it, it's a, a process called de novo lipogenesis. And what your, what, what the, your liver does with the alcohol is identical to what it does with the fructose. Make fat. It makes fat. It lays down fat in the liver, and it sends fat out into the bloodstream, le leading to a condition called lipide uh, dyslipidemia, which is why it's important to go in and get your blood tested. And, the, and what's, what's great, uh, uh, um, you'll see on, on sugarscience.org, is one of the, there's only one way that you yourself can self-diagnose if you suspect you might have metabolic syndrome. 
And that's because just like a person who drinks too much alcohol gets a beer belly, you'll get a sugar belly. <laughs> People with, with uh, metabolic syndrome tend to have a lot of fat around the waist. And so even if you're thin, but you have a lot of fat around the waist, that could be an indication that you might have metabolic syndrome. And it's really worth most of the f features of metabolic syndrome. You need to go to your doctor, your primary care doc, and get blood tests drawn. But the one way that a, a person looking at themselves or their, their son or daughter or grandparent can uh, wonder if they might have it is to see that sugar belly. And so that alcohol is operating in the liver in the very same process that the fructose is, as well as trans fats, by the way. How There's about trans fats also? How about different. if you have a question, why don't you write it? Um, how about uh, rice? I've heard. Recently, people said, well, don't eat white rice, because that's like eating sugar. And then somebody the other week said to me, well, brown rice is just white rice in a brown suit. So um, what? I can try it. I can try it. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I, can, I can. This comes up a lot for people with diabetes. I have a large Asian population. They eat a lot of rice. And we have long discussions about rice. Um, <laughs> So the classic teaching is that rice is a complex carbohydrate, meaning it's, it's a lot of sugars lined up together, bonded together. Um, the benefit of that is that it takes a lot longer to digest and, and change those into the individual glucose molecules, and therefore you don't get that spike in blood sugar that you get with liquid sugar. The classic teaching also is that brown rice, because it is not refined, because the, I think it's the hull is still on the, the rice, that that takes even longer to digest, and so is less harmful than white rice, which is less harmful than liquid sugar. Um, there was a recent study um, that many of you probably heard about in the news about glycemic load um, that kind of has us all up in arms and wondering you know, what to make of this classic teaching about brown rice being better than white rice, um, wherein they didn't actually find that to be the case in this one single study. And like Laura had said, I mean, it is one study, and um, it flies in the face of many, many studies that have suggested that the less refined the food is, the more healthy it is. So I, I haven't changed my practice in terms of my nutritional counseling for my patients with diabetes. I don't know what you guys think about that latest study and, and its implications. Yeah. And, it, and, in, and, and so your white foods, your white carbohydrates, are going to break down pretty and, darn fast uh, into, their lo like Dean said, they're long chains of glucose molecules. And they're going to break down pretty fast. And where does the digestion start? In the mouth. <laughs> in the mouth. And what's it do to teeth? Well, sure, yeah. Um, fermentable carbohydrates, we call them. Anything that's going to be broken down by bacteria can be harmful to the mouth. So those bacteria will right away, as Dean had mentioned before, start turning those sugars into acids, uh, even if it's white rice or brown rice. That will occur. So certainly from a dental standpoint, that's something the carbs, to think yeah. about as well. The, you know, if you're on Weight Watchers, um, one of the things they say, you know, you have your little... For those of us who have done it, right, you have your little handheld, and if you eat fruit or vegetables, no points, right? So all of a sudden, I'm hearing fruit, sugar, right? So I'm eating, I'm upping my course of fruit because it doesn't count towards points because it has fiber. Do I need to be worried about the sugar in fruit? Absolutely not. Uh, this has been a topic of a lot of debate in the literature on cardiovascular disease. And what we know is that fruit consumption is protective of cardiovascular disease, and added sugar, refined sugar consumption is detrimental. It increases your risk of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular mortality, dying from heart disease as well. Uh, the discussions around mechanisms, there's a lot of research in this area about why fruit would help help you prevent heart disease and uh, added sugar and refined sugar wouldn't, would it harm you. Uh, the current uh, understanding is that when you eat that, that um, fructose and the glucose in the, in the fruit, it comes with fiber. It takes your body a long time to process through that fiber to get that fructose and that glucose out. That gives your liver, your pancreas, the whole system a lot of time 
to work to process that stuff so you're not just hitting those organs with a blast of sugar and asking them to process things very quickly. And at the same time, uh, Kimber Stanhope on our team uh, is very interested in the fact that the antioxidants and various phytonutrients that come in fruit might actually operate in the gut to uh, help uh, whatever harmful effects of fructose there might be on the liver, those antioxidants and good, good th nutrients that come with the fruit might actually support, uh, um, uh, improve your health and mitigate the, any harms that would be caused by the fructose in the liver. Thank you. Uh, someone in the audience says they, uh, they exercise a lot and uh, they tend to rely on sports drinks. So their question is, what should I drink during and after long workouts for sustained energy? If it's not sports drinks. I can tackle that. I mean, I, I think that there is a market-driven assumption that most types of uh, exercise, recreational or otherwise, leads to these profound imbalances in electrolytes and glucose and protein, and, and it, they've essentially created a niche that needs to be filled by their product. Um, with very rare exception, that is entirely false. I mean, if you run a marathon or do a triathlon or whatever, certainly you have to replenish you know, your fluids and your electrolytes and your nutrients. Um, I think for the overwhelming majority of cases, um, Nothing is needed water. other than Maybe. yeah water <laughs> and then eating your meal after your exercise. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there is really uh, some compelling evidence, particularly among children, that all the benefits of exercise, like kids playing soccer, are being mitigated or reversed because their parents then attack them at halftime with the fruit Gatorade. drinks and the energy <laughs> drinks and the whatever, and like the kid has like kicked the ball once. And, you know, so, I mean, I think there is validity to the question if the level of exercise is at the level that would truly uh, you know, extinguish your electrolytes. And, that's, and, that's pretty and rare. In, in a systematic review that was recently published uh, that looked at four athletes do these drinks enhance performance, 50% yeah. of the formulations did nothing for, for athletes. Uh, the other, uh, there's, there, there's also been recently in the British Medical Journal a wonderful review of the research on sports drinks, and it turns out that the vast majority of these studies have been industry funded. Yeah. And while not, well, just because an investigator accepts industry funding doesn't mean that everything they say is inaccurate. As I pointed out before, we have evidence that studies funded by industry have a, probabil a higher probability of coming out with, quote, industry-friendly findings. So we're really careful when we, uh, at, at Sugar Science, looking, it, looking at those things. We, so we have one yeah. other question, and then I'm mindful of time. I was just wondering, when you were talking about um, the sugar belly, is that visceral fat, which is more dangerous for us, or is it subcutaneous fat, which could actually be in the it's the visceral repeat, fat. Repeat the question. The, oh, it, what, what, what kind of fat is, it, what, what's the concern with sugar belly? What kind of fat is on the, is, is hanging around your, your midsection? And the concern there is that it's visceral fat, uh, which would be, uh, and, and there's evidence that the, the, it's, a, it's a unique kind of fat that produces hormonal signaling and may very well uh, have its own adverse impact on the balance of hormones in your body. And so it's not, it's not benign fat. It's, it's, it's fat that's selectively deposited on your belly and has this property of hormonal signaling that uh, endocrinologists are really concerned about. It's probably sending out bad messages to the brain and other parts of the body. What, what are the inches? For, inches for men is 40 inches, right? It's, on, it's all on sugarscience.org, sugar every bit of it. We, so and, the two and, takeaways are go to sugarscience.org <laughs> yeah. and go to and use hashtag SugarShift2015 and tell us what it, one thing, one small thing you're going to do. So what I'm going to do is drink yeah. water, yeah. more water, instead of reaching for that 
fruit drink. We literally have millions of people who are, are, are uh, it, it, that we're reaching, are reaching out to us on uh, Twitter and social media. But it would be very powerful for folks at UCSF one of the nation's leading academic medical centers, at health sciences campuses, to write in with their ideas about how to shift our sugar intake. I think that'd be really fun. All right, big hand. Thank you very much. Thank you.